Ojo, welcome to Wa Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN 3E Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I am the teacher Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you're welcome to call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express U channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available for me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday from three till four in the afternoon, and we are in our third week of our nine week course. A reminder of what work to submit for marking, at this point you should likely to be submitting some, some work. The key questions are at the end of each of your IL lesson. There's a list there of which questions to support us, sorry, submit for this lesson, for each lesson. Uh, do all of them. Some of them are check your understanding questions that are inside the a chapter in the booklet or some of them are the activities at the end not all of them are activities but there are a couple and then there are the review questions that are at the end of each chapter so please show all of your work your steps and your thinking this way i can understand truly what you understand and what you don't and make sure that you're actually answering the question that is being asked you're welcome to do this by hand or electronically if you want to write in the workbook you can there's not a lot of space but if you'd like to as long as i can read it that is fine uh, if you want to write it out by hand on a separate piece of paper, that's fine too. If you're going to do it electronically, uh, Word and Google Docs are the files that are going to be the easiest for me to open. If you're going to use something else, that's probably fine. Just let me know so that we can make sure that I can actually open your work. All right, so then once you have your work done, there's three ways to submit it. So the first method is to submit um, by scanning and sending your work electronically. So if you write it out by hand, then scan it either with a smartphone, either with an iPhone notes app or the Android Google Drive app. There's other things as well, but those are just apps that both those phones automatically come with or devices come with. Uh, if you don't have a smartphone or device to use those apps for and you just wanna take a picture, that's fine too. Just uh, the app, if you scan it, it's a smaller file. And so that makes it a little bit easier to send. Then to send it, you can email it to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can send it to me through Facebook Messenger at bslatewasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street, where the bright red building next to the post office. And we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance, so you can just put your work in there. The third method is to hand it into your DEC. And then your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wassa. So you can friend me there or subscribe to my YouTube channel and then you'll get notifications every time I upload one of our lessons. All of our lessons are recorded and then uploaded to YouTube after airing. Um, I have them under a playlist for called SVN 3E, so all of them are there. And there's also a list of, um, or an access to all of our support for supplementary videos that I play in class. Um, there's there so you can find the original sources and if you want to watch other videos that they've made you can go through there and find them through that list science is really visual and i try to incorporate as many diagrams or charts and videos as possible just as that it sort of engages our brains a little bit in more ways than just text so i strongly encourage you to connect to the video if you can't join me live it's fine uh in if you're struggling to get onto YouTube to find those, re the replays there, let me know and I can send you a copy of them if you don't have reliable internet to get to those YouTube videos. But that's gonna say up for the most success if you watch them opposed to just listening. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot Z-A. My Facebook is bslatewasa, and my phone number is 807-737-1488, extension 2209. 
You can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. I like to position myself within our context within our society before diving into our con our subject matter just because this shapes how I teach science and what I think is important and I think that um, that can make things problematic sometimes so I just honor that. Uh, I have white settler ancestry, I am a white person so I have white privilege and that shapes how I've experienced education and also how I teach. So I recognize that and I try to do things differently um, outside of my experience and integrate experiences that are not my own. Um, but that is challenging and I don't get it right all of the time. I do live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. So I am attempting to learn from those around me and the culture around me in order to integrate that into my ways of teaching. This is the first time that I've taught this course. So I do have lots to learn and also to unlearn. Um, so if you have any suggestions or things that I could improve upon, please just let me know and I'm happy to accommodate such requests. Also, our textbook is Eurocentric. It positions uh, the European ideal and experience as the experience, not just one experience, but as the only experience. Um, and this is problematic. There also may be problematic language. I haven't read the whole book, so I don't know. Um, I'm going, I'm reading it as we go along. Um, so I apologize if anything does come up, but I do know that it ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences. I have noticed that already. So that is problematic. And therefore I try to integrate as much as I can into our, uh, into our course, though I'm sure that I'm missing things sometimes. So if you have, again, have any suggestions, please let me know and I will learn and do better as I can. All right, so we are wrapping up unit two, which has been maintaining eco healthy ecosystems. So a reminder that ecosystems clean, or at least healthy ecosystems, clean our water, purify our air, maintain our soil, regulate the climate, recycle nutrients, and provide us with food. They provide raw materials and resources for the medicines and other purposes, that, other things that we can create. So basically they're foundation of all of our civilization and sustain our lives. We could not live without these ecosystems. They're pretty essential and we impact them in pretty negative ways, which we've discussed. Today's lesson number seven is invasive species and the effects and then how to monitor and control them. So this is in a way that we haven't talked about um, these ecosystems. We talked a lot about the, uh, a bit about the climate, about the soil, about the water, about the air, um, but now we're gonna talk about invasive species and what that means. So our learning goals are that at the end, we're able to name several invasive species in Canada and their effects on native species and ecosystems. And you will understand the techniques involved in monitoring and controlling these invasive species. You know these might the learning goals because one, you know both plant and animal invasive species. Two, you can explain the impacts invasive species have on ecosystems. And three, you can describe techniques used to help ecosystems recover and prevent future devastation. Okay, so let's figure out the effects of, of species. So overall, people have experimented both intentionally and accidentally with introducing new plants and animals into ecosystems. Most often, the results have been costly and disastrous. We'll see an example later on of how it has benefited things, but that's only after invasive species has first uh, attacked the ecosystem. First, we want to talk about native species, sorry, before we talk about invasive species, just so that we know what we're comparing it to. So native species are a species that normally lives and thrives in a particular ecosystems. For what is a species? Uh, so that's a group of organisms that reproduce only with each other and that grow, act, and look alike. So it's it, like not, birds are not, uh, Birds are a species, but then within there, there are robins and geese, but they're all species. Um, they all have similar, whereas turtles are a different species or ferns are a different species. Then this can include any species that develop with the surrounding habitat and can be assisted by or affected by the, a new species. So habitat, so where everyone's living, is so it's the region where a plant or animal naturally grows or lives. Um, just this might be some language that I'm using throughout. I want to make sure that we're on the same page. 
All right, so native species are adapted or suited to live in the climate, soils, and waters in which they naturally live and with the other species with which they share their habitat and range with. So they are, this is where they naturally live and everybody who is natural in that area, they are, they work together. Um, they were not introduced by humans and they've been part of nature where they are for many hundreds and thousands of years. Things can be natural species in, or native species in one place and an invasive species at another place. So where they naturally are, where they've been for hundreds of thousands of years, that is their natural habitat, and that's where they are native species. They usually rely on one another, so on other native species, which, which they share their habitats. So thinking about, remembering about producers, consumers, and decomposers, they work together to thrive in that ecosystem, so they need each other. Native species also live in balance with each other in their ecosystem. So if you have too much of one, they end up balancing out um, and that uh, it may not, for a period of time, there might be too much of one or not enough of one, but over time, this balances out, things go in cycles, um, but they can always balance together in a natural environment. So here are a lot of a bunch of native species in uh, Northwestern Ontario, where we are. So I tried to sort of find our range. So we have trumpeter swans, uh, milkweed, Great blue heron, uh, black spruce, moose, sorry, black bear, martens, partridges, these, oh, I can't remember, sunflower, but it's a different kind of sunflower than the usual one, the one that we all think of, but I can't remember what it is right now. Uh, birch trees and lynx, these are all different animals and plants that are naturally in, these are have been here for hundreds and thousands of years and are naturally in uh, our communities in Northwestern Ontario. If we were to go further south or further north from Sioux Lookout, it would be slightly different um, because the habitats are slightly different and who thrives in those environments is gonna be different. So these are the ones that are na na native to our particular area. Okay, so then now let's talk about non-native species. So non-native species are a species that originated somewhere other than its current location and has been introduced to the area where it now lives. The introduction of non-native species has happened largely due to international travel and trade, agriculture, the release of exotic pets and plants into the wild and the use of live bait. So basically non-native species have, are in spaces where they haven't been before basically because of human activities. They generally, they can come from both distant lands or from nearby areas. So it could be something as much as um, moving from, it could be a couple hours away, or it could be uh, uh, like tens or 20 like hours away. So it's, um, it's not about how far they come from, it's just the fact that they're, they're being introduced new to an ecosystem. So this graph shows us that uh, since the 1600s, there have been some, this is when colonization and movement of people started to pick up in the world. And so as people moved around, invasive species happened. So as we talk about, we can hear um, probably in history, you've heard of like rats or plagues or like pathogens or, um, beetles or bugs and things like that moving from Europe to North America or other places in the world and that that was gradual because travel didn't happen very much but then as soon as the industrial revolution happened and we started traveling more and being able to uh, move things around more then it skyrocketed and just increased 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 how many non-native species are in new places so over 185 aquatic species have been introduced to the Great Lakes alone in Canada. Um, there's probably more in other places, like adding them all together, but just in the Great Lakes, there's over 185 aquatic species that are new. There are about 1,229 non-native plant species in Canada, um, though 
316 are from other areas of Canada. They're not all from other countries, but places in the world. But still, that's a lot of place, plants that are new places. There are over eight, 80 species of insects and diseases that are non-native. And overall, 12% of the 11,950 species assessed in the wild species of 2010 the general status of species in Canada are not native. So this is a little bit old information. There are things that's probably number has changed, but still 12% of our, of our general species are non native. So here are some examples. Um, the gray partridge is not native, the common lilac, the weeping willow, sorry, my pictures aren't great, uh, the house sparrow, and the red ear slider turtle are all non have all been introduced to our to Ontario. Um, it was harder, a little bit harder to find things specific, non-native specific to our region. Um, but so I just sort of looked in Ontario in general. Um, yeah, so these are all did not originally develop in this area. And now we have invasive species. So invasive species are species of plant or animal that outcompetes other species causing damage to the ecosystem. So they take over and mean, make it hard for other species, for the native species to thrive. So while it's impossible to say exactly how many invasive species are living in Canada, in 2002, researchers estimated that at least 1,442 invasive species, including fish, plants, insects, and invertebrates, are now living in the country's farmlands, forests, and waterways. So again, this is 20 years ago, so that number is probably more, that was an estimate at that time, so it's probably greater. And invasive species are all non-native species, um, but not all non-native species are invasive species. They don't all take over spaces, um, though they both are all originate from somewhere else. So invasive species are concerning for the following reasons. They complete directly with native species for food and for habitat. They reduce local biodiversity and put added pressure on endangered or at-risk species. I think I read somewhere that like 40% of extinct animals are extinct due to there being invasive species in their environments and that pushed them out. They spread diseases like Lyme disease to humans or botulism to fish and shorebirds through aquatic and land-based food webs. So they introduce new diseases. They kill agricultural crops and native trees. And they cost billions in management fees and loss of economic values of crops, crops, forests, and fisheries. So they have both an environmental impact, but also an economic impact um, on our communities. So how do invasive species actually spread? So they're often introduced accidentally, though humans are almost always involved in some way. This is basically always our fault, though it's not, it's not always intentional. So for one, when ocean going ships empty their ballast, which is the compartment at the base of the vessel that used to help it stay in balance um, in the waterway. So they empty their water in like the Great Lakes or uh, like the St. Lawrence River or things like that, um, that water which has come into their ships from another part in the world will be carrying numerous species that are not native to that basin, to that water bed. Uh, climate change is another way that invasive species spread throughout Canada. So deer ticks that carry Lyme disease were once controlled by cold winters. So they wouldn't be able to survive in Canada because they would die in the winter. But now as climate change is happening and our, we're not having as cold and as long winters all over Canada, um, there's more and more common to have deer ticks that are carrying Lyme disease. And then humans have also introduced some species to new regions in Canada to serve an ecological function or a recreational purpose. So sometimes we do do it on purpose. So Chinook and coho salmon were increased in the 1960s, both to control alleywives, which is another invasive fish, and also to create a sport fishery for salmon. So we introduced these invasive species um, for our own need, and that's gonna have an impact on the ecosystem. So here are some examples of invasive species in Ontario. Again, I couldn't find um, enough information to say specifically for Northwestern Ontario, uh, so I just did in Ontario in general. 
Uh, so zebra mussels are something that is very common uh, talked about in terms of invasive, invasive species and uh, that is in water. Uh, Eurasian milfoil is a plant, it's an invasive species uh, plant, a seed, like a seagrass. Wild pigs are actually an invasive species, which I was surprised to hear as it's not something that I've seen a lot of wild pigs ro roaming around, but I guess they have an impact in the areas where they are. And um, so that qualifies. Garlic mustard and autumn olive is, are two uh, like the shrubs. A giant hogweed we've heard a lot about recently as it is this big, huge uh, plant that causes really intense burns and uh, skin irritations for people. So people think that it's something else and try to take it out or they just try to take it out because they don't want it there. It takes up a lot of space and is pushing out other plants and then it uh, burns people and then people have had really big bad effects. The New Zealand mud snail is another invasive species. So it's like a range from plants to animals to snails. Like it really could be all sorts of different things. The European frog bit, which is like, looks like a lily pad to me, but they in marshes. The round gold me, which is this fish. And then also the spongy moth, which is, these are the sort, sorts of things that you can see on trees that like just sort of decimate trees. They just uh, like totally kill them because they just populate and then wipe out the tree, eat all the plant, eat all the leaves, and then just take out the tree. So they can have a really, really negative impact. So you should now be able to hopefully talk about native species, non-native species, and uh, invasive species, sorry, <laughs> my brain. Um, the key questions are on page 55, the check your understandings one to three. Uh, I didn't talk about the difference between a predator and a prey in our lesson, but there is information in your booklet about that. So you can look there if you feel like you need some support to answer that particular question. All right, so now we need to talk about monitoring and controlling of these species. So we've talked about uh, what they are, and now we need to talk about how we deal with them. So every new invasive species has costs associated with it. These are costs we cannot afford to ignore. Unfortunately, established invasive and non-native species are usually impossible to fully eliminate. However, we can lessen their impacts by monitoring and controlling their population. So what this is saying is that as soon as something, an invasive species or a non-native species comes and you realize that they're not a healthy species in that in ecosystem, we can't get rid of them. It's impossible to get rid of them. We may be able to control the population and make them so that they're not having as much of an impact on the ecosystem, but it's never, I don't know of any situation where we were able to totally eliminate them once they've been introduced. So how do we monitor them? So monitoring consists of checking and testing for non-native and invasive species. So it's paying attention and uh, making lists basically. So this is done at sites considered vulnerable or where populations of invasive species are suspected or known. So it's both done where we already know invasive species are, but where we think they are and also areas that we're concerned about where we think that uh, they are close to where we know invasive species is or they have something that is likely to be um, attacked by invasive species. So then monitoring those areas in order to prevent spread is really important. They also involve, it involves preparing a database of native and invasive species and the populations at a site. So this is done through surveys using like aerial photographs or just people counting actual species and such. Uh, also in water, like netting and taking water samples uh, to measure and to track. So it's a lot of tracking, it's a lot of counting, it's a lot of organization of information so that we know what's going on in these environments. And so we're not surprised if something's happened and we can hopefully prevent it. And so yes, so this information is used to repair plants in case of new introductions. So both in terms of if there's an invasive species that we know about and we're concerned about, or also if 
just in terms of having a general plan in case something else comes in because if we're able to catch it before it becomes established then possibly we will be able to reverse its impact but if once it's established it's, it's basically impossible to get rid of so when we're monitoring there's there's this this is a um, web flowchart that sort of processes in terms of how do we figure it out what's going on so it starts with risk ass assessment and analysis so what is going on in the ecosystem and how risky is it so first is it early detection and rapid response so have we, have we is it early that we know that there the invasive species is in the ecosystem and can we respond quickly so did the monitoring so if once we do that um that early detection rapid response whatever we whatever they implement to deal with whatever the invasive species is then they have to check to see if it's working if it worked yes then great then you go back to prevention and you try to prevent it um, and then that continues to cycle around in terms of monitoring and aiming for prevention if that continues to work then we continue to prevent we continue to do the same thing and that's one part of the cycle if prevention doesn't work then we go back to early detection and rapid response and then we continue to cycle through there if that if we're preventing if prevention doesn't work but our response works then that's one loop but if when we're monitoring our early detection rapid response doesn't work then we control and we manage so if the control and management is working then we if that's able to do it then we go back to prevention hopefully and continue through those earlier stages if the control or monitoring didn't work the control failed then we need to try something else and so then we're back to assessment and risk analysis and trying a new early detection or a new control and management tactic for whatever that species is so it's just a loop back and forth in terms of monitoring and then controlling and then monitoring and then controlling and then monitoring and then controlling if we get that far hopefully we're just monitoring and preventing but that's not likely all the time so we monitor and then we control so it's all connected so let's look in terms of what does control actually look like so here as I said they're all interconnected so control is actually a combination of prevention and early detection um, and containment and then restoration so those are both monitoring and controlling for some of these elements so for prevention which is ideal which is where we want to start with right we don't want to have to deal with it we want to avoid having to deal with it so examples of where that's used is if there's a suspected shipment or materials that may be um, have an invasive species uh, so they're either turned away or they're quarantined at the border entry points so that's something that happens uh, at like when shipments or like ships or things are coming from other places that they're checked and if there's concern then we prevent it we don't let those things in so that they don't let the contaminants in which means that we have to maintain our databases of habitats and native and invasive species so that we know where things are and what is native and what's invasive um, and then also having public education campaigns so that people know this to me this is a lot of uh, the like don't move your firewood leave your firewood where you are like don't travel with your firewood so like get local firewood you see these signs everywhere in terms of the bugs that are on wood if you take your firewood from one area say you go from Ontario to <coughs> the um, east coast and you take your firewood with you and then you're bringing bugs that are on your firewood because there's little bugs and then you're planting them you're depositing them in the east coast and that's going to affect your um that those ecosystems so some examples of invasive species that have been controlled using prevention are the asian longhorn beetle and the emerald ash borer beetle so it works then early detection is so the prevention isn't working because it can't work as work for everything so early detection and elimination where it's possible 
So the example of how this works is that, so it's ongoing monitoring and advanced planning to deal with invasions. So it's gonna be different depending on what the situation is. And West Nile virus is one example of it being controlled. So it still exists, it still is a concern, but with all the detection and plans in place means that we don't, it's not as concerning in Ontario, in Canada, as it is in other places. The third method is containment and management. And so this is physical, chemical, and biological controls about how we actually contain and manage uh, invasive species. So there's different ways that this works, and we're going to watch a video about uh, the biological control for purple loosestrife. Um, and Sue Lamprey is another one that has been controlled with these tools. Then the fourth way is ecosystem rest restoration. So if none of these things have worked, then returning of native species to the habitats um, with supports is a way to help recover those ecosystems. So there's artificial ponds in the Don Valley Brickworks in Toronto, which is in downtown Toronto, um, that are now supporting native species of frogs, fish, birds, and mammals. And so even though it's in downtown Toronto and uh, it was pretty much wiped out, it's, it's a very, uh, the water there is very polluted. Um, so having artificial ponds is integrating those native species back into that habitat. That's another way that we control and rehabilitate ecosystems. Okay, so now we're going to watch this video about purple loose leaf, loose strife, sorry, um, which is very, has been a very, very common invader in all of Ontario. And we're going to learn about how they use some controlling measures to um, beat back the invasion and so made it so it's not quite so invasive. Hopefully, it's going to work for me today. of our native wetlands. A number of control mechanisms were tried through the decades um, until the mid-80s when someone had the idea of investigating biological control. Today, the quiet efforts of a tiny leaf-feeding beetle are leading to the large-scale control of purple loosestrife, one of Ontario's most tenacious wetland invaders. Purple loosestrife is a wetland plant. It is an invasive plant. It's an exotic plant that came from Europe many, many years ago in the 1800s. It produces lots of seeds and it spreads very quickly. And it moved into a lot of wetlands in North America. And that impacted uh, virtually hundreds of species that survive in wetlands. It impacted the, uh, the way that wetlands function in terms of uh, water recycling and uh, water clarification and so on. And at that point, it's, it's not the best for wildlife. It can get so dense that wildlife can't get through it. Left unchecked, it's, it becomes a real problem for our wetlands. In Ontario, concern was mounting and purple loosestrike populations were exploding. Shorelines of rivers and lakes, roadsides, low-lying areas, and specifically wetlands were affected. About 75% of our wetlands are threatened by development in Ontario. So when purple loosestrike was introduced, it created one more stressor on those systems that is very important in terms of ecosystem functioning and uh, for fish and wildlife. We've tried uh, mechanical means to remove the, the purple root strike. The problem is if you leave even a little piece of root there, you can end up with a new plant. In the mid-1980s, the potential for controlling purple root strife naturally using a technology called biological control was being investigated. In Europe, the hunt for natural predators of purple root strife was on. Biological control is a management technique that uh, involves taking a non-native invasive species and going back to the place of origin of that species and finding its natural predators and then essentially reuniting them. Well, not just any natural predator will do. 
They have to be thoroughly tested. They must be safe to use. The risk to other species, especially native species, must be low. That is important when we're looking for biocontrol agents. We need to find something that's host-specific, something that isn't going to feed on anything else. In 1992, after years of testing, Agriculture Canada approved two species of beetle for release in Canada. The Galarachella beetles are leaf-feeding beetles, and the larvae and the adults both feed on the leaves and the stems of the plant. These species have co-evolved over the years, um, and now they have they've become so specific with one another that the beetles can't survive without purple strife. It's not an unusual relationship in the plant insect world. And these beetles have evolved, much like the monarch butterfly has evolved with milkweed, these have evolved with the strife, and that's all that they feed on, so that's why they're using them here. Extensive testing and monitoring have been done in both the U.S. and Ontario to ensure that the beetles are not affecting native plant populations by switching their food preference. All the research that's been done to date shows that the beetles do not have any negative impacts on native plant species in North America. Initially, releases were by the University of Guelph, but the project soon blossomed to include a collective of governments, conservation groups, and volunteers. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters Project Purple was aimed at education. Through a number of different agencies, they've now been released at over 400 locations in Ontario alone. And what effects have the beetles had in Ontario? The impact of the beetles has just been phenomenal. Because of this feeding action, the plants start to get smaller in size, the root masses shrink, uh, the flowering uh, is cut back, and because there's fewer flowers, fewer seeds are produced. Um, with time, individual plants can disappear altogether, and uh, with more time, uh, plant communities can be drastically affected just through the feeding action of the beetles. As the numbers of beetles increases, the adults fly to find more plants. In areas where there are lots, they can be collected and moved around to new locations. We cut the stems that have the, the insect larvae on them, and we collect them, and we can actually transfer them. Today, the threat of this invasive plant species, once considered a beautiful killer of Ontario's wetlands, is changing. The landscape is really changing. We're hearing from people what happened to the food strife? Is it not a problem anymore? We're just not seeing it. Essentially, the beetles can now be found in virtually every watershed in southern Ontario and also in a number of watersheds in northern Ontario. And because the program has focused on watersheds, the ecosystems have helped the beetles along. On over 80% of the sites where the insects were released, there's impact to the food strife. But the plants are not disappearing altogether. Loose strife will always be a part of the plant communities here in Ontario. The beetles don't eradicate the plants. Um, purple loose strife is their only source of food, so it's not in their best interest to get rid of all of the loose strife. And there can be fluctuations with time in the number of beetles and the amount of loose strife in a location. The, the numbers of plants get down to the point where it's just a nice pretty flower in amongst the, the wetland uh, vegetation. That will control the, the uh, numbers of beetles that we have. So what we're really seeing is large tracts of watersheds where loose strife is still there, but it's much less apparent than it was 10 years ago, for example. So biological control returns that wetland to a pre-invasion state. So the loose strife is suppressed, and the native plants begin to come back into that environment. And in turn, the native wildlife also will begin to come back in and use it. This biological control success story is offering hope that a little beetle with a big appetite will control purple loose strife and serve as an example for the control of other non-native invaders of the future. All the work is done by nature. The solution is, is here before us. There's very little input required on our part now, which is one of the beautiful things about biocontrol. It's very inexpensive. It's simple, it's passive, and it's forever. And we hope that it will help lay the groundwork for support from the public and from government for additional programs like this to address the concerns for other invasive species in the future. So, if you know an area in Ontario where purple loose strife is thriving,
call the Invading Species Hotline. But before you do, look way down into the plants. Tiny beetles may already be there, gobbling up one of the most well-known invasive plant species of Ontario's invaluable wetlands. So that was one example of biocontrol, which is a pretty cool way of dealing with uh, an invasive species because it, as they said in the video, is letting nature do the work, finding a natural predator um, and checking to make sure that that natural predator is only going to be a predator for the current, for the one invasive species that you're dealing with. Um, so that includes monitoring, controlling, again, to make sure that the research is done really well. Um, and then it just deals with that one thing and makes it so that, though it doesn't eradicate it, like we said, um, but it does make it less invasive and therefore native plants in animals are able to be reintroduced and re they naturally return to the ecosystems and thrive again. So one thing that I was just watching when I was thinking about it while watching the video this time was wondering about uh, what are predators for the beetles? Like why don't those for this particular situation for purple loose strife, how come the beetles don't become an invasive species. Yes, I recognize they only eat the purple loosestrife, um, but then what happens to the beetles? Do they just like die of old age and therefore don't become a, a concern? Or what happens if other animals who are native animals eat those beetles? What are the impacts of that? Or what are the impacts when they die and decompose in the wetlands? So this video didn't touch on that and I didn't really think about it before. Um, before right now, but that is an interesting question to ask and to look into further. Obviously, they've done a lot of research, and so I trust that they know the answers to the questions. Um, the people who made the choices to introduce the beetle into our wetlands, but that is something to further to think about in terms of not just is the new beetle going to attack other plants, but what is it going to poison the animals who might eat it or is it going to what's it going to affect is going to have on the soil once it dies and decomposes so again you have to think about multiple layers in terms of when you're introducing a, a new species into an area so this is an example where humans actively introduce an invasive a, a species a non-native species into an ecosystem in canada but in with the intent to control the invasive species that was already there Okay, sorry. So now you can do the key questions on page 57, which is number one. Um, so what occurs when an area or region is monitored for invasive and native species? Okay, let's consolidate. Let's recap what we have talked about today. So we are in lesson seven. So our invasive species, the effects, the monitoring, and the control of them. So first we talked about just what native species are, examples, and uh, why they're defined that way. And then non-native species and invasive species. We have examples of both of those in terms of plants and animals and then the differences between them. Again, remember that all invasive species are non-native, but not all non-native species are invasive species. So like for example, the beetle, whose name I can't remember, um, is a non-native species. It's not from Canada, it's from uh, Europe, but it is not invasive. It was just uh, just cleaning out the purple loose strife, which is an invasive species, which would eradicate other things, whereas the beetle doesn't have an impact on anything other than just the purple loose strife. So there's, that's one example of the difference between non-native and invasive species. 
So then remembering that monitoring is a combination of checking and testing for both non-native and invasive species, and then developing a database for prediction of what's gonna happen. So paying attention and that cycle of prevention, hopefully early response, early detection and response, and then further impact of control if needed. And have that. it's a big cycle and it's continuous. It's not something that you can be like, oh, we've we've got the purple loose leaf under control. We don't need to worry about it anymore. Though it might not be something that is high priority, it is something that continues needs to be checked on to make sure that things aren't acclimatizing, aren't adjusting, aren't adapting and changing and therefore not working in the same way. These beetles could start eating something else and then what would that mean? Um, so it's important to continue to monitor even after a successful control. And then control, remember there were the four levels in terms of prevention, early detection and elimination, containment and management, and then ecosystem restoration. So hopefully you don't, we are less and less getting to the ecosystem restoration. Hopefully we're spending more and more time in the prevention and be able to think proactively about the choices that we're making and the impacts that we're having on ecosystems. But realistically, we know that all of these levels are really important um, because we can't control everything. So as ideally as it would be to just prevent, we have to have these other levels in order to deal with invasive species. So our success criteria are one, that you know both plant and animal invasive species, uh, particularly for Ontario, um, that's where we're located. So because of course, remember that things that are invasive species here aren't gonna be invasive species somewhere else. And things that are native here are not gonna be native somewhere else that are could, potentially could be invasive somewhere else. So we're talking specifically about Ontario. Then explaining the impacts of invasive species that have on an ecosystem. So why are they concerning? And then that you could describe techniques used to help ecosystems to recover and prevent further devastation. So the monitoring control elements in terms of how we deal with invasive species issues and concerns. All right, so now you can do the key questions. This is one, a situation where we have activity on page 58, activity 2.4. Um, so you're gonna go through, it's like a little lab. Um, it's not a big lab and we don't have to have any beakers or any chemicals, but it is the idea is that you're doing a little bit of a lab. Um, to work through analysis of something. So the purpose is to analyze the spread of purple loosestrife, invasive species, and the effects on the ecosystem. So this is thinking about the impacts. We just watched a video about purple loosestrife, right? Um, and this isn't talking about the beetle, but it's talking about the before the beetle arrived and what are the what happened. So talking about the background of the situation and then the procedure. So you're gonna complete this table and then you're gonna create a graph. Um, if you, you can use the graph either by hand or on a computer if you'd like. Then you're gonna create a second graph that plots this other information. And then you're going to interpret those graphs and you're gonna answer these questions by interpreting those gra graphs. And then you're going to conclude, you're going to analyze all of your data, all of your information, and give some advice to some community members in terms of how you, they should deal with purple loose leaf. You don't have to do a lot of um, research. If you want to integrate some of the things that we talked about in class, that is fine. But this is just walking you through how you do this. If you have any questions, this is a little bit different than the other work that you've done. If you have any questions, please reach out and we can, uh, I can support you to walk through how to do this activity. And then there's also the page 59 review questions, one to 11 are also part of the key questions so that you need to do those as well as the activity. All right, so if, as always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to chat. My, you can call me at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or you can call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. I now have access to my voicemail, hopefully, so I've dealt with that issue, so feel free to leave a voicemail um, and then I can get call you back. My email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. 
My Facebook is Broadland. Sorry, no, it's not. My Facebook is B Slate Wassa, uh, and my YouTube is B Slate Wassa. So you could find a replay of this video and also the uh, supplementary videos if you'd like to rewatch the one about purple loose leaf, or if you'd like to look at other things um, in those avenues. There are links there on our YouTube channel in our playlist SVN3E. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., though I teach from 9 to 10 and then from 3 to 4, so those are not good times to try to reach me as I'm on air. But otherwise, I will get back to you within those hours as fast as I can. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day, and miigwech.